All right, we're fortunate enough to be joined now by Connecticut Superior Court Judge uh, Thomas McCausher. He's got a brand new book out there, The Common Flaw, Needless Complexity in the Courts and 50 Ways to Reduce It. Judge Mike Leon, Nick Saveri, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast with us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, we always have so many different legal analysts on. You're the first judge we've had on. I know you're obviously a a former attorney yourself. Uh, I'd love to get your perspective on a bunch of different things that are playing out in the legal realm from that, you know, sitting on the bench side of it. But first, uh, let's talk a little bit about your book and give our audience a little bit of a 30,000 foot overview of what made you want to write it and what are some of the complexities in the court for people that are not uh, working in the courts every day? Well, I guess I felt somebody had to write it because uh, I think that uh, some faith is being lost in our, our institutions, including the courts. And part of it is because of what the book is about. The co- It's called The Common Flaw, Needless Complexity in the Courts and 50 Ways to Reduce It. And it's that needless complexity that I've been watching for about 40 years in court that I think is is undermining people's uh, faith in the institution. The cases take too long, uh, they, they're too expensive, uh, and we can't understand when judges write opinions, we can't understand what they're saying. So they aren't faith reaffirming exercises. So I'm trying to invent an, a new way uh, of looking at a lawsuit, and there are 50 specific ways to do it, to turn a lawsuit into something where uh, it focuses on what I've been describing as a humanist approach to litigation rather than a formalist approach to litigation. So the goal is to try to build faith in our institutions and pass on the lessons I've learned. You know, it's so funny that you said that phrase because it feels like the phrase of trust in our institutions has been kind of weaponized or at least uh, to a lesser uh, extent and connotation hijacked, right? Where people are just not trusting in the process. You hear a lot of this two-tiered legal system and things like that. We're going to get into a bunch of that, but what are we getting wrong out there about the role of judges and the amount of influence that they have in a trial based on some of the characterizations that you've seen in the media? What, what's your uh, what's your opinion on that as, as somebody that has presided over a bunch of different cases and has been in the spotlight? Well, frankly, the first thing that bothers me, actually, is that people have got it all wrong uh, if they're suggesting that our courts are dishonest. Our courts are more honest than they have ever been and yet we are losing faith in them. And to me, the reason we're losing faith is about the process. It is about the needless complexity. It's about the fact that people can't figure out what's going on in court and they don't get heard in court. 99.9% of cases never get a trial today. So people go to court, they get messed this way, they get messed that way, and then they get scooted out the door, either with having their case dismissed or being forced into a settlement because they're broke. Now, if we did our jobs more efficiently, we wouldn't have that sort of uh, chatter going on that there must be something you know, behind the scenes. But it isn't about courts being dishonest. I, I'm, I feel great about uh, the institution as a, a bedrock of the country. But what bothers me is that I don't feel great about is the way it's being perceived. And I think we could fix that. Very well said. And I I appreciate that a lot, especially as somebody with your expertise and knowledge in it. You know, we love to do this on the show where Nick and I do a moment of literacy and we kind of break down some legal terms. You you do that a lot in the book as well, where you try to break it down as simple as possible. But um, we've seen this wording, speedy trial, the right to a speedy trial kind of mentioned so far in high profile cases that are happening right now with the former president and some of his associates across the different jurisdictions. Um, Can you kind of break down uh, when people talk about a speedy trial and some of the things that you mentioned about the courts being slow and and like your first chapter and stuff like that, is that a measurement that is fairly applied in all cases, uh, which allows a trial to move forward quickly? What causes trials to take longer? Can you kind of break down a little bit of what the right to a speedy trial actually is involved in? Well, that's, it's, of course, a constitutional concept. It's, a, uh, it's used in criminal courts. It's a right held by the defendant uh, that if they, you know, they, if they want to get to trial, the court has to stop things and get them to a trial. The funny thing is in criminal cases is that many, many of the people accused of crimes don't want a speedy trial because they're out and they're free and they don't want to have the thing go forward at all as late as they possibly can. Uh, it's in civil cases that you have parties who are either being sued and are, are 
paying in astronomical sums to their lawyers or are suing and want to get relief. They're the ones probably more interested in having a speedy trial. And they're the ones who get held up by the process because lawsuits get filed and the, the, the document initiating the lawsuit, which we call the complaint, immediately comes under attack, all for technical reasons, not because what you're saying isn't true, not because somebody hasn't been wrong, but because you've written the thing in a way that doesn't conform to the notion of what these things should look like, or someone says that you filed in the wrong court, you're the wrong person to bring the lawsuit, it's too late, it's too early, it's you know, everything except the merits of the lawsuit. And that's just the initial phase that slows things down, because there's attack after attack on the court's jurisdiction, on the drafting of the complaint, uh, on the... Uh, gathering of evidence, the process we call discovery, and it's endless. And these things can go on uh, for years. I've been on the bench a decade, and there's a case that I worked on beginning in 2001. And I'm going to get off the bench now, and 22 years later, it's still sitting there being litigated because there's always something a clever lawyer can do to bring a lawsuit to a halt. I've got a piece on that uh, today, actually, in The Hill, uh, which is uh, related to explaining what, what has happened with the asymmetric uses of lawsuits. Lots of people point to Donald Trump about that, about you can tie a matter up in knots by throwing it into court. And so when people see that, they start to, they start to question our system, and I hate that. So my goal is to try and create a way in which that doesn't happen. But we're going to get into the former president in a bunch, too, because, you know, as any defense attorney that's been on television will say, uh, something the former president should do is delay, delay, delay. Right. We saw in one instance he asked for a court date in 2026, and now it's obviously been agreed upon for March 4th of 2024. I want to get some of your opinions of how you would uh, preside over a case involving somebody so high profile as the former president. But first, on the book real quick. We've kind of discussed this uh, a little bit in the back and forth, but was there an actual uh oh moment for you, maybe another catalyst that led you to writing this book? Because the book reads like you had a reaction to something. Something actually happened sure. and you said, I need to I need to write this down and I need to actually figure out how to put pen to paper and help out uh, the legal system and the court system. So th was there that moment there that led to this book? Yeah, there was because... Um... For eight of the 10 years I've been on the bench, I've been a complex litigation judge. And in watching complex civil cases, because I've done, done complex civil cases and I just finished doing complex family cases, and watching these complex cases unfold, I saw that you had people being bankrupted by the process. The worst place to see it is, of course, the family court, where families' finances are absolutely ruined by the process of being heard in court. I also saw it in commercial context where, you know, big companies destroying small companies because the system lets them do it by dragging up the case, by filing many motions, by uh, seeking huge supplies of documents and evidence and deposing everybody who ever heard of the case. It costs it costs millions. And so what happens is the people are just exhausted and they settle for pennies on the dollar if they're suing. Uh, or they pay pennies on the dollar if they're not suing. And so, yeah, that was the trigger for me to see it unfolding in these complex cases and, and seeing the impact it was having, because it's a kind of asymmetric warfare to use a case to bludgeon somebody. And I don't think judges should be a party to it. Many, many judges see their job as, I think the chief justice said, you know, we call balls and strikes. You're sort of an observer rather than, for instance, a, a leader. And I, I think, you know, one of the things I learned from doing complex cases is that judges sometimes, or most times, should be leaders and not merely observers of what's going on because the harm, the harm is enormous. Yeah. You know, it's so funny that you mentioned leaders because now it's going to funnel into some questions we had for you about this whole process right now that's playing out. And we, we see judges so prominently featured and mentioned once a case is assigned to them. Obviously, we know about Judge Eileen Cannon down here where I live in Florida and uh, the uh, Mar-a-Lago case uh, uh, involving the former president. We know about the judge in the D.C. federal court. I would love to know for you, 
right now, as you see this playing out right now, uh, of the upcoming trials that the former president will be going through, um, how would you administer, how would you lead uh, in terms of making sure everything is being followed by the books, the different motions that are going to be filed? Um, could you just kind of break down if something like this high profile where it involves a defendant like the former president, we've never seen this before. So how would you, uh, if you got assigned a, a one of these cases in one of these jurisdictions, what would be some of the things that you'd be looking to, to administer and apply? Well, first, let me make clear that I, I have no business uh, saying how the case should come out or suggesting uh, anything in terms of specific rulings a judge can make, but I can talk about how to handle complex uh, cases, including high profile ones, because I've had uh, a number of them. I had to consider the, the constitutionality of the entire Connecticut educational system at one point in my career. I also had to pass judgment on uh, the governor's emergency orders during COVID. These things, you know, uh, the media is in the courtroom, people are commenting on it, it becomes a political football. And so you, you just have to, you have to establish leadership over the case from the outset. The first thing you do is bring in the parties and you set set the ground rules that this case is going to be handled in court in an orderly fashion uh, and we're going to show respect for the participants uh, in in the in the litigation uh, and once you get the ground rules down you then have to police and one thing that happens in court too often is that parties have to go through uh, a long process to try to get heard when something goes wrong when one party is doing some some misconduct or something and they want to get heard about it, they file a motion and the motion file, it gets responded to. And then the court might set a hearing. And this can take months. The way I've done it in cases like that is you simply email my clerk and say, we've got a problem. And what I do, and I do, I've been doing this every day for years now, you get on a, on a call like this. We use uh, Microsoft Teams in our system. We're on Zoom. You get on there and you say, what's the problem? And somebody says, this party is doing this, this party is doing that rather than briefing, rather than having motions. Those things can take months. You just get on there and you say, what is the problem? Okay, here's how we're gonna handle it. And I write down an order and it goes out immediately. And the consequences of failing to obey that order are laid out. Uh, and judges have a lot of tools to be able to do that, uh, including in cases where Someone is, again, I think of it as asymmetrical warfare, where they're out there in the media blasting the court itself. And there are judges actually, you know, they have the tools uh, to deal with this and they should do it. And I'd be glad to tell you about some of them if you'd like. Quick break from our pod to tell you about a new pod at Fresh Roasted Coffee, Envy Pods. So if you go to freshroastedcoffee.com, my partner's shaking his head. That's a good change. Listen, what are you, are you kidding me? It was good. No, I shook my head. I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Because I saw the I saw this picture earlier. I was like, it, I saw it, I saw what you're doing. It is pretty good. That's right. So listen, the new Envy Pods over at FreshRoastedCoffee.com, the official sponsor of Can We Please Talk, environmentally safe, compostable. You can go check these out at FreshRoastedCoffee.com. When you open up the package, it smells delicious. I'm telling you, you can't smell it on here, but I, I promise you that when I opened this this morning to make my cup of coffee, it was delicious. Head to freshroastedcoffee.com today. Use the promo code Can We Get 20 for 20% off your first order or hit the link in our show details. No, well, actually, it funnels into the follow up perfectly because um, your book opens up about the courts can't keep up with, with memes, right? Um, so, in that vein, it seems as though right now, so high profile with the former president, but he has such a platform because he's running for the highest office in the land again. So he's very front facing in terms of interviews, the campaign trail, and also owns his own social media app. And it seems like with each of these cases and each of these judges that will be assigned to these different jurisdictions, he, he is lambasting you know, the prosecution. He's doing things with respect to the judge. So I'm just curious. I know, I know it's such a, a wild scenario because you probably have never encountered somebody so <laughs> front facing that is kind of, you know, taking apart the system while it's unfolding. But you, you mentioned some of the, the tools that a judge would have at its disposal. So what do you think are some of the things judges in, in these specific cases that are, you know, the subject of the defendant's ire on social media? What are some things that they can do and enforce given 
the nature of the defendant who is so high profile and a former president of the United States? Well, obviously, there's the First Amendment concern that people, you know, have a right to speak and they certainly have a right to say that they don't think they're being fairly prosecuted. But that doesn't mean mean that any person and I again, I'll talk about complex cases. I've I've had conspiracy theorists in front of me. I've had people, you know, blogging while the court's in session. I've had people trying to confront and and frankly, you know, judges uh, in complex family matters get uh, people trying to kill them. So you're under a lot of pressure and there's a lot of focus. Uh, and uh, what happens is you can put somebody to the test when they're using asymmetric warfare to lie about the judge, to lie about the court, lie about a prosecutor, lie about witnesses. The way I have done it, and I've had to deal with this, uh, is to say, all right, so you claim uh, this judge is biased. If it were me, I'd send the case to another judge to have a hearing. You claim I'm biased, I send it to somebody else. I've had judges send those cases to me. And the question is, is this judge biased? And I've had the most outrageous allegations of, you know, the judges involved in a payback scheme and a, and a bribery scheme or involved in human trafficking and all kinds of things. So what I've done in cases like that, I say, all right, so you think this judge is, is, is biased, put on your evidence. You claim that this person is corrupt. Put on the evidence. If it turns out that you have a basis to say what you're saying, I tell you that I'm going to act on it. If there were any, if it were truth to it, if there was a biased judge or a corrupt judge, my God, you know, any judge would be glad to uncover that and slam it and do something uh, to, to make sure it didn't stop and that people got punished. But we also know that in these cases that you, you say, put on your evidence, you say this is true, you're going around saying it, and then they come in and there's no evidence. Give it to me. Come on, where is it? Because if it's true, I'm going to act on it. But then it proves to be not true. And at that point, out-of-court statements that are lies, that have been proved to be lies in the court, that are designed to undercut in-court proceedings, can be acted on by the judge. That you can, you can punish them uh, in a wide variety of ways. Criminal court, of course, they have the most uh, powerful means by the conditions of release. You're, you're prohibited from trying to undercut the credibility of the hearing, to undercut the people in the case. And when it's already been proved that you've been lying about it, then you can say, I'm sorry, we're going to have to change the conditions of your release. One more public lie about this court or its participants and, you know, no more bond for you. You get, you get incarcerated. Very easy in a criminal case, a little harder in a civil case. But the point about in a civil case, you have the power of saying, all right, your misconduct gets dealt with in court by saying you either lose the lawsuit. You lo this is civil cases now. You lose the lawsuit. You lose part of the lawsuit. Or when the jury gets impaneled, the judge says to the jury, look, I want you to know that there have been a hearing and this person has told 42 public lies about this proceeding. There was a hearing held and it was concluded on it. So you ladies and gentlemen, knowing that this person's lied 42 times can consider that when you're deciding whether the person is lying to you now. So there are lots of tools to, to be able to deal with it. What, what worries me, I think the mistake too many judges do is they wait too long to do something about it. And you've lost control of the train, you know, it starts wobbling back and forth and, and could jump off of the tracks. And I know some people in criminal cases say, well, I'm going to move up the trial date. But you, you can't you can't usually do that fast enough to uh, to address the real problem. It's it takes too long. You have to give people the chance to get their evidence and their things. And both sides would probably say, hey, wait a minute, we can't rush immediately in the trial. I need a few weeks. But in the meantime, that damage is being done out there. So the, I prefer the other way of dealing it head, head on. You know, Judge, one of the uh, one of the cool things, I guess, or maybe not cool, you're going to tell us in a second about advancements in technology has been cameras in the courtroom, right? We've seen court TV catch fire and obviously different trials, high profile trials, high profile defendants on television. Now, we know with the former president <clears throat> facing federal and state charges that the state court in Georgia will have access to cameras in federal court. 
there won't be any access to cameras. I want to ask you as a judge, um, I think a lot of people are thinking about this. They, they are lacking trust in the, in the institution. Like you mentioned, um, what would, would you be open to having court uh, be open to the public via television for the former president in these federal cases? What do you make of that? Could, is there a possibility in the interest of transparency and who the defendant is as the former president of the United States, do we have a right to actually see these trials take place so the people can judge for themselves because he is running for the highest office in the land? Yeah. In general, that's a tough question because uh, people start playing to the cameras sometimes and people try to disrupt proceedings sometimes. But in general, I, I tend to think that, and, and by the way, Connecticut law is this way, that we have a presumption that cameras can be had. in the court. Our state has a presumption that it's the right thing to do. I did the first trial during COVID that was conducted uh, remotely over uh, teams in, in Connecticut. And that was that was live streamed on on uh, YouTube. So it was there on YouTube and, and anybody could watch the court proceedings. You we had a series of channels where you could go to this courthouse, go to that courthouse and see what's going on. And uh, I was kind of excited about that. We backed away from it some. But uh, I do a lot of proceedings that are because I do complex cases. I do proceedings from all over the state. And many times I do them remotely. And anybody who wants to come in has a right to come in and watch that remote proceeding. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I'm all for it. I, I, I do believe that, I do believe that on balance, uh, that sort of transparency is, is a good thing because people will, people will see that, uh, you know, you've got honest people trying to do their best. Uh, and when you see real judges uh, trying to hear cases and things, you know, 99% of the time they're, they're just decent people who are, who are trying to do a job. So I think that helps. Yeah. Judge, before we let you go, somebody, I would love to do this a little quick elevator pitch. I'm at the bookstore or somebody listening to this program is at the bookstore. They happen to see this book, The Common Floor, out there. What is something you want them to take away from this book? Whether or not they're you know, in the legal realm or they're not, what is something you would want them to take away from this book? Well, let's say you're not in the legal realm. It's, it's a look behind the courthouse door. Uh, it's a look at a future where uh, the courts are responsive to, to public needs. For people in the, uh, in the legal profession, it's a roadmap. So you can get a, a look at the, what we do, you get a roadmap out of the woods. Uh, and so that's what I'd like uh, people to see is that you can learn a lot about courts if you're not a lawyer. You can learn how to fix them if you are. I love it. Judge Thomas McCausher, you know, as a criminal justice minor, I wish I had been a lawyer. So I appreciate this book. Thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. Continue success to you, sir. And please stay safe. Thanks very much. It was very enjoyable talk to you. Hey, thanks for watching the Can We Please Talk podcast. Whatever clip you just watched, we hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you stick around for some more. Subscribe to the channel. My partner's over here smashing the button. Come on, do him a favor. So hit subscribe.